let's look at page 13. Sometimes things that everybody knows turn out not to be correct when you push them a little deeper. Start at verse 18, bottom of the page. Shem God said, it is not good that man be alone. I will make him a helper corresponding to him. This is the resolution to create woman. Here the translation is perfectly exact. It is not good that man be alone. It doesn't say it's not good for man to be alone. It says it's not good that man be alone. Can you hear a difference between those two things? Between what it does say and what it doesn't say? It's, it's kind of, in, <clears throat> from the text, you kind of are forced to infer that like man needs a counterbalance. Before you get to the second half, just the first half of the sentence. It is not good that man be alone. It's like God's opinion rather than what God... Okay, what is the difference between that and what it doesn't say, it's not good for man to be alone? Okay. Well, if it said if it's for man, it would, it would be bad for man. But the fact that it says that man, it's bad that man be alone, you could say like man, just man by himself could be a very destructive force or... You know, or something. Or, so, or something, not a positive thing. Very good. If it had written it's not good for man to be alone, then you would con conclude man is missing something then the creation of woman would be for him. But it doesn't say that. It says it's not good that man be alone. Saying man's being alone isn't good. Why isn't it good? The text doesn't give you a clue. The text is really blank. It just means a one-man world is not a good thing. And it doesn't say why. So you can't conclude from those words that woman was created to serve man, to help man, to uh, uh, provide him with something that he needs, you cannot conclude that because that's not what it says. Now, the text goes on. I'll make him a helper corresponding. Corresponding is the polite, gentle way to say it. In Hebrew, it's against. <clears throat> Ezer Kenegdo. I'll make him a helper against him. And the reader could be forgiven if he found that a bit puzzling. Helper against him? Your old tradition says, well, it depends upon him. If he deserves help, she'll help him. If he doesn't deserve help, then she'll be against him. Those words already tell you something extremely important and fundamental. That she's independent. If he deserves it, she'll help him. If he doesn't deserve it, she'll be against him. So she's not just taking orders. She's not just a reflection of him. She's making her own decision, making her own evaluation. And not only is she making her own decision, her own evaluation, but if I push the words really hard, it sounds like there's a certain superiority there. He might deserve her help or might not. That means to say he might be in a good position or in a bad position. She, on the other hand, if he deserves her help, she'll help him. And if he doesn't deserve her help, she won't help him. That means that she's always right. She's always right. If he deserves the help, she gives it. If he doesn't deserve the help, she doesn't give it, which means she's always right. He might not be always right, but she's always right. If anything, this description of the creation of woman gives the woman a tremendous advantage, yeah. I thought that the Gemara says that it means that like, if a man doesn't marry the right woman, then they'll have a, a bad life, and if a man does, does marry the right woman, that will have a happy life. Not as far as I know. The Gemara says, Zoha, Ezer. Lo Zoha, Kenegdo. Those are the words of the Gemara that I, that I know. I believe Rashi quotes it here, if I'm not mistaken. So, and if anything, the, the picture is that um, the woman is independent and she has a certain focus 
certain certain um, way of relating to him, and it depends upon whether he deserves her help or not. Now, I want to push a philosophical point here, which is also political and um, has to do with feminism and all the rest. Let's say, and this is not, not far from the truth, let's say her job is to enable him to realize his potential. Let's say that's her job. Her job is to enable him to realize his potential. Does that imply that she is inferior? She's worth less. Not worthless. She's worth less than he is. Uh, because, after all, her job is only to enable him to realize his potential. So he, realizing his potential, must be the highest goal. And she's serving that goal because she's worth less. Is that a fair inference? Okay, if I'm asking you and I have this big black hat on, you probably can guess what my view is. But it would be very hard to avoid that inference if you are talking with people who represent a feminist point of view and all the rest. That's exactly the inference that they're going to lay on you. If A's job is to help B satisfy or, or realize B's potential, then A is serving B's potential. B must be more important than A. Now, several of you guessed correctly that it's an incorrect inference. Why is it incorrect? How would you argue with somebody who says it is correct? Yes. If A is created to serve B, then B must be superior, more important, more valuable, and A is just inferior, second class. Because he can't reach his potential without her. It's a physical impossibility. OK, still. So God created him dependent, and her job is to fill that dependency. He can't do it on his own. OK. You mean because he's not independent, that's a weakness in him? Maybe. Still one might say, okay, there is that weakness, but still, if she's created to help him, to enable him to fulfill his potential, then she exists only for his sake. And that means that she's inferior. Her potential is already realized. She doesn't need any help getting to her. Okay, you could say that, but it's, I think the situation is much, much worse than that. Let's, let's scout the, 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 the position in two ways. Let's look at it secu from a secular point of view, and then we'll look at it from a religious point of view. This idea is really... Um, worthy of some critical evaluation. Pity the poor psychiatrist. What does a psychiatrist do? Somebody comes in and says, Doc, every night before I go to sleep, I've got to wash my hands 106 times. It's very exhausting. The skin of my hands is, it, help me, Doc, cure me. What is the psychiatrist doing? He's curing this fellow. He's helping make this fellow's life better. Does that make the psychiatrist second class? Inferior? He's just working so as to help this guy out of a jam? How about a physical doctor? A guy goes with a broken leg, says, Doc, I can't walk, I can't walk, I broke a leg. Don't worry, I'll fix it for you. So the doctor's fixing the other guy's leg. So the doctor must be inferior. Your auto mechanic, your car doesn't work, he's just making your car run. So then he's a toady, he's your slave, he's just helping you get around town. What about teachers? Teachers are communicating information to people who are much more ignorant than they are. The teacher is raising the students' understanding and information. So then the teacher must be second class. He's just helping the students realize their intellectual potential. That's all he's doing. You can go through all the helping professions and re re repeat the same critique, which now begins to sound ridiculous. More than, more than that, I'm going to tell you something which might break your heart and uh, might uh, be uh, disappointing to you. Someday, you're probably going to have to work. Why would anybody pay you to do anything? Why would anybody do that? Why should he give you money to do something? The answer is because what you do earns him more money than he pays you. If it didn't earn him more money than he pays you, he wouldn't pay you. Is that running a charity service? So that means everybody who works, anyone who holds a job, is already just a toady, just a slave, inferior, because what he's doing is making more money for somebody else. Doesn't this begin to sound absurd? Now, someone will say, look, you're just talking about jobs. We're talking about the person's whole existence is for this purpose. Yes, that is a difference, but it's a difference that doesn't count. When the person's working at his job, is his working at his job a position of inferiority? Surely not. 
The fact that a psychiatrist works at helping people who are sick become healthy doesn't mean that he's somehow inferior to the people who are sick and becoming healthy. It just doesn't mean that. So the whole, the whole framework in which the criticism is, is expressed is not a, an intellectually comp competent framework. That's from a secular point of view. From a religious point of view, it's much worse. God created the universe for what purpose? He created it for the purpose of giving good. Does that make God second class? God's whole purpose in creating the universe is to give good to his creatures. If playing a helping role, playing an enabling role, playing a developmental role in somebody else makes you second class, and that means from the Jewish point of view, God is second class, that's probably not correct. If A is playing the role of enabling B to reach his potential, A is playing the role of God vis-a-vis -vis B. That better not be an inferior role. So the idea that if a woman, woman is created in order to enable man to reach his potential, that would imply that she's an inferior role, that's absolutely incompetent. It's incompetent from a secular point of view, and it's certainly incompetent from a Jewish point of view. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's just an incompetent inference. And, I think it's important to know that, yeah. So if God's ultimate, ultimate purpose is to bestow good, how would you then explain, like, suffering in the world? Okay, I mean, we're, 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 you came in a bit late, and we're, we're in the middle of explaining a verse which has to do with the creation of woman vis-a-vis -vis man, um, but the short, the short one-liner is all suffering has to serve some purpose, otherwise God wouldn't do it. Okay. If you are a dedicated parent, and you are dedicated to the good and... Uh, uh, benefit of your children, how then can you punish them? They don't like it when you punish them. It hurts them to punish them. She said, well, because their overall development requires it. And it doesn't mean that I don't love them and support them wholly. And, you know, that's, that's the short answer. Okay, so now we're, we're on page 13, and that's the creation of the two of them. Now chapter 3 on page 15. This is a famous story. Story of the tree of, of knowledge of good and evil. Oh, I'm sorry, I've got to say something before that. Um, on page 13 again, verse 15, in the middle of the page, Hashem God took the man, placed him in the Garden of Eden to work it in the garden, whatever that means. Hashem God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree in the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and bad, you must not eat from it. For on the day you eat from it, you shall surely die. Now, I have to alert you here to an ambiguity. Your translator took a certain path, but it's not obvious that it's the right path, and there are certainly others who disagree. Uh, in the Hebrew, there are two verbs that are doubled. They appear twice, one after the other, in a form which is emphasis. If you look at the Hebrew side from the bottom, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines up in the middle of the line, fourth word in, Mikoil Eitzagan, from all the tre uh, trees of the, of the garden, Achoil Tochel. That's the verb to eat twice. The first is the infinitive form, and the second is the command form. Then, two lines down, the beginning of the line, it has mos tamus. Mos means die. Mos tamus means emphasized in the idea of die. The translator renders mos tamus as you shall surely die. Okay. It's not just going to die, but you shall surely die. That's how you strengthen it, emphasize it. What are we going to do with achol tochel? Eat, eat. Your translator takes the eat as Permission, you may eat. You're permitted to eat. How do you emphasize a permission? How do you strengthen a permission? So he writes, your translator writes, you may freely eat. It's not, it's not really clear what the difference is between you may eat from all the trees or you may freely eat from all the trees. What more do I get? What more freedom do I get if I say I may freely eat? What was implied missing if I just say you may eat from all the trees? It's not exactly obvious. Commentators take this here as a command. 
You're forbidden to eat from the tree of knowledge, and you are commanded to eat from the other trees. And if you say, listen, he's got to live. He's got to live. The only food that's available is the fruit from the trees. Of course he's going to eat from the, tree, fruit from the trees. That's true. That's true. But the difference between doing something because it's a necessity versus doing it because God commands it. If God commands it, it puts you in a relationship with God. It's an interaction. Not just that God goes on vacation and you do what you have to do. So there's really a double charge here. Eat because I said so from the other trees and don't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Okay? And the, the um, qualifier, if you eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you're going to die. So if you're, if you're dying, it says, Mot tamut. Right. Which means there'll be no way out. There'll be no, no appeal. It's not just a preliminary judgment. You know, when you get a judgment in the court, in America you say, well, I could go over said to a repeal court. The judgment is, this will happen. But it's not settled because you can always appeal above it. And there are times when God says such and such will happen, and if a person prays or he does tshuva or he rectifies in some other way, then it might not happen. It's not absolute. When you double it, it means it's much more absolute. Yeah. I don't know. It wasn't absolute because later on in the story, yes, some are you hiding? The whole idea was that, was that he was giving him the chance to do tshuva. No, 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 not, not, that, that doesn't change this. Doing tshuva, that will not change this. Will not change this. Okay. Now, let's take a look at chapter 3 on page 15. I told you some tiny pieces of background about this yesterday, but the serpent was cunning beyond any beast of the field that Hashem God had made. He said to the woman, did perhaps God say you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? That's how you do it. You start with an absurd position, and then you work back to what it is you want to get to. Did God say you have to starve to death? You can't eat from any of these trees in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, of course not. Are you nuts? Of the fruit of any tree of the garden, we may eat. If you look in the Hebrew here, the verb is single, not double. Adam was told you may, you may or must eat, Achol tochel. Here she says, nohal. Just single, not double. Of the fruit of the tree which is in the center of the garden, God has said, you shall neither eat of it nor touch it lest you die. Did God say that to Adam? Anything about touching it? Not a word. Not a word. And die here is also singular, not double. Now, what's going on? Where did she get her information from? God spoke to Adam before she was created. So she got her information from him. What happened? Did he give an accurate report of the information and she misunderstood it? Did she lie talking to the snake? Both of those are extremely implausible. No, what happened is he didn't give her an accurate account of the information. He failed to, dis to, to describe to her the information as it really happened. First of all, he didn't tell her that there's a command to eat from the other trees. Second of all, he didn't double the, the, the dying. He left it as single. And third of all, he put in an extra prohibition. He said, God told me we shouldn't touch it wasn't true. His motivation was to set up a screen. If we can touch it and play with it and interact with it, it's taking too much of a chance. I'll tell her not to touch it. I'll tell her God said not to touch it. That was a tragic mistake from which the rabbis derive a rule. If the rabbis make a, make a law, which they can do and have done thousands of times, identify it as rabbinic. Put a label on it. This is something we added. Don't ever pass it off as if God said it. Now watch what happens. So this is how she answers the snake, the serpent. The serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. He doubles it. You will not surely die. It's not going to happen. For God knows that on the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and bad. Be like God may not be the right translation, but I'm going to push that point at the moment. 
Now, the Midrash here fills a hole in the text. Put yourself in the scenario. The woman heard from her husband, God told me PQR. She accepts it. She trusts him. That means the creator said PQR. And the serpent says, no, it's not true. What should her reaction to the serpent be? You're a jerk. What are you talking about? The creator of the universe said it. You're telling me it's not true? Why should I listen to you? You're hopeless. So what the Midrash says is, he pushed her against the tree. He pushed her against the tree and she didn't die. He said, see? What you were told about touching the tree isn't true? The same thing goes for eating it. It's not true either. That's how he got leverage with her. And he got that leverage only because Adam failed and added on that extra prohibition without telling her that it came from him. Had Adam been honest and thorough and said, God told us not to touch it, or not to eat it, and if we eat it, we'll die. And I recommend that we don't touch it, so we'll just stay away from it. This could never have happened. But no, he represented as if God said, don't touch it or you'll die. That's how the snake got leverage with her. We together so far? Now let's think it through. Should there be leverage here or not? Is this real evidence against what she thinks God said? He pushes her against the tree and she doesn't die? There are two ways to understand God's statement. One way is what she heard, don't touch the tree. Because if you touch the tree, you're going to die. Why? Because I have put 10,000 volts of electricity into that tree. And if you touch the tree, you're going to burn. You're just going to be burned up by the electricity. That's one way to read it. The other way to read it, which is this. I'm commanding you not to touch the tree. If you touch the tree, I'm going to punish you by your death. Which do you think is the reasonable way to understand what God said? Is it that I made it a natural killer or that I'm commanding you not to do it and if you do, I'm, I'm threatening you with a punishment if you do it? Isn't it obvious that the latter is what the way to understand what God said? Okay, but then if the snake pushes her against the tree, that's not her fault. That's not her fault. Why should God punish her for that? She didn't rebel. She didn't disobey. The snake pushed her. She should have been able to think her way out of that. This is how it goes with the Yetzirah, with the evil inclination. There's always some rationalization to hang it on where, if you really want it anyway, you use the rationalization to justify to yourself what you're doing. That's all the snake did. The snake said, I can just give her a rationalization, and then if she wants it, I'll have the leverage that I want, uh, that I, uh, that I want to have. And, in fact... She did want it. Now, he says, God is vicious. He told you not to eat it because on the day, if you eat it, on the day you eat it, your eyes will be open. He doesn't want you to be in possession of the knowledge of good and evil as he is. That's why he told you not to eat it. But this story is a fairy story. So why did he put it there? Put it someplace else. Destroy it. Hide it, make it invisible. I mean, <laughs> he's afraid you're going to eat it, so he told you not to eat it? It's a, it's a, it's a. Now, look at how it appears to her. Six, the woman perceived that the tree was good for eating, was a delight to the eyes. The tree was desirable as a means to wisdom. She took up its fruit and ate. Stop there. Um, the translation is pretty good. You perceive that the tree was good for eating, the light to the eyes. The tree was desirable as a means to wisdom. I took it with fruit and ate. Let me tell you how everybody, I would say almost everybody in the world reads this and why it's wrong. They read this as a description of her weakness, her failure. Then the text says she gave to her husband, he ate also. She's the source of the failure. I wanted you to know that Maimonides, in the Guide of the Perplexed, says these words express his point of view, his state of mind. Not that his instead of hers, but hers, his as well. He saw the tree in exactly these words as well. That's Maimonides in the Guide of the Perplexed. But Moshe Chaim Lutzato, in one of his Kabbalistic books, Adi Bamaron, says exactly the same thing. That these words describe Adam's state of mind. 
So it is an equal failure on the part of both of them. Yes, maybe she expressed to her husband a desire that he should do it, but he did it with this state of mind. So he's equally guilty, not less guilty in any way. Okay? That's how this transgression took place, roughly. Now, the eyes of both of them were, were open, and they realized that they were naked, they sewed together a fig leaf, made themselves aprons. Obviously, this had nothing to do with vision. Their eyelids flapped open and closed, just like yours and I, uh, mine do, and their retinas were fine, their optic nerves were fine. Maimonides points out that this phrase in Hebrew refers to understanding. And he says, everywhere in the Tanakh, where it talks about opening eyes with this word, lefkalach, pikuach enayim, refers to understanding, not physical vision. He brings a proof from a verse which I thought was a contradiction and it took me years to figure out why he was right. Um, now, that means that, as all the commentators point out, they knew beforehand they didn't have clothes on. They, they understood something about being naked they didn't understand before. And that's why they closed themselves. What that is, we'll talk about when I finish the story. But in the meantime, it's a matter of understanding. Now comes what I told you yesterday. They heard the sound of Hashem God. Now, their translator writes, not even correctly, manifesting itself in the garden toward the evening. The word in Hebrew is mishalech. Mishalech means to stroll. They heard a sound of God strolling in the garden. Strolling is a localized manifestation. It takes place in one position. As I told you yesterday, every interaction between God and man is the result of God's not using his infinity, but relating in only one specific finite dimension. And they said, if that's the way he's relating, he's relating as if he's occupying a particular position. If we hide, he won't know where we are. Of course he knows where we are. He's the creator of the universe, but he's not using that knowledge. And they're right. So they hide. Hashem, God, called out to the man and said to him, where are you? And he gives up. He gives up. God doesn't say to him, dope, you can't hide from the creator. No. I'm running a localized interaction, so I'm running it out in terms of its character. He said, I heard the sound of you, of you in, the, in the garden, and I was afraid because I am naked and I hid. Shem said to him, God said to him, who told you you are naked? Have you eaten from the tree from which I commanded you not to eat? Now the next verse is absolutely crucial. I'll read it to you, and tell me how you hear it. The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave to me of the tree, and I ate. What's happening here? Okay, I got another bunch of nods. He's blaming the woman. Now read it again. The woman whom you gave to be with me. The woman whom you gave to be with me. She gave it to me and I ate. Where's he pointing the finger? He's not the pointing the finger at her. He's pointing the finger at God. You put her here. So I trusted her. You put her here. So I shared with her and so forth. So you put her here. This is a good example of how everyone can know what it says and it's wrong. Everyone knows he blamed her. I read a book which is written by someone who calls himself an Orthodox rabbi. And he said, you see here that Adam is an immature early teen who thinks that you can avoid responsibility by saying somebody else told me. He doesn't know that if somebody, you can ask him, and he told you to jump off the roof. Would you jump off the roof? Clearly not. So, you know, something that you teach nine-year-olds. But he's not, not, that's not what's going on in here at all. He's saying, you put her here to be with me. So I gave my trust to her. I, I invested her. That's also wrong, but it's not the same mistake. It's not at all the same mistake. Okay. Hashem God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So then God curses the serpent. Let's leave that aside. 16. To the woman he said, I will greatly increase your suffering and your childbearing. In pain you shall bear children. 
Your craving shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Ah, here we go. Here we go. I can see the Molotov cocktails and the, the signs and the speakers and the op-eds in the New York Times. He shall rule over the woman. Man rules over the woman. Right there in Genesis. How could you deny that? Clearly it's saying that the woman, the, man, the husband rules over the wife. The man rules over the woman. Well, let me let you in on the real story. This is a curse. This is a curse. What is the status of a curse? What is a curse? What kind of thing is a curse? Is a curse a mitzvah, a value, a rule, an obligation, a law, a commandment? Is that what a curse is? Is a curse an inescapable reality, something that God puts into the world that can't be avoided? Is it either of those things? Surely not. Because in this very verse, it says, you're going to give birth to children in pain. Is that a mitzvah, a rule, a law? Not at all. There is no prohibition for a Haredi woman to take anesthesia during childbirth. There's no such prohibition. Is it an inescapable reality that for sure every woman's going to have pain in childbirth? No, we know it's escapable. So what does this verse mean? As a curse, what does it mean? It's not a mitzvah, and it's not an inescapable reality. So what is it? And let me prove to you that this is correct before I tell you what it really is. Look at the next page. Here's the curse to the man. To Adam, he said, because you listened to the voice of your wife and ate the tree which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Accursed is the ground because of you. Through suffering shall you eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles shall it spread for you, and shall eat from the herb of the field. By the sweat of your brow shall you eat bread until you return to the ground from which you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. In other words, you're going to be a poor, unsuccessful, starving farmer. Is that a mitzvah? Rule? Law? Value? Commandment? Not at all. Go to Flatbush and you'll meet their Haredi Jews who are diamond dealers, and they do not get thorns and thistles from their gardens, thank you very much. They go to 6th Avenue in Manhattan, and they live on millions of dollars, and they live in mansions in Flatbush. This is not a mitzvah, nor is it an inescapable reality. So what are these pronouncements? These pronouncements are tendencies that are in the world, things that can happen. There are conditions which make these things normal to happen, and if you can avoid them, so much the better. They are not things that you pledge allegiance to. They are things that you avoid as best you can. And the more you avoid them, the better off you are. Indeed, part of this curse on the ground was relieved by Noah. When Noah lived, the curse on the ground, part of it was relieved because of Noah's greatness, and that was a step forward. Indeed, in Jewish law, there are a number of economic laws which make it impossible for a husband to rule over his wife. Here's one. Husband has a job, earns money. Let's say the wife earns money, one way or another. How is the money distributed? How is the expenses of the household paid? There are two arrangements. One arrangement is that the husband has sole responsibility for supporting the family. And whatever the wife earns goes to him. He takes possession of whatever she earns. That's one arrangement. The other arrangement is the wife keeps a separate income. She contributes her share of the uh, support of the household, and the incomes are completely separate. Who determines which arrangement it is? Only the wife. She alone decides which arrangement it shall be. That means she controls the economics of the family. It doesn't sound to me like he's lording it over her or he's ruling over her. If anything, she's getting a terrific advantage. She can say to him, I don't want responsibility for support. You support the family. Go out and work. That's your job. If I happen to earn any money, I'll give it to you. Or she could say, no, you're a bus driver and I'm a financial advisor of, of, of Citibank. You know, uh, we'll contribute equal shares and I'll keep my separate bank account. Thank you, because uh, you know, I prefer it that way. Whichever way she prefers it, that's how it is. There are many laws like that. 
At any rate, that's the status of these statements. These statements are curses, and they are certainly not meant as either mitzvahs or inescapable realities. Furthermore, back to 16, some commentators say you should, um, when you read a verse, read part of a verse, it should be relevant to the context. To the woman, he said, I'll greatly increase your suffering in childbearing, in pain you shall bear ch children. Okay. Pregnancy is going to be difficult. Childbearing is going to be difficult. Your craving shall be for your husband, meaning, suppose a woman decides to opt out. Okay, there's this divine decree that, and it's going to, most of the time it's going to happen that way, that pregnancy is difficult and childbearing is going to be painful and dangerous. I don't want to have any part of it. Forget it. You know, do it some other way. No, no, a woman will not be fulfilled. She will not be satisfied. She will not be inspired by life unless she has children. The vast, vast majority of women, that's true. And it might be true for all of them because when they deny it, they might be guilty of what the communists used to call false consciousness. But I'll leave that aside. I'm not going to take that doctrinaire. The vast, vast majority of that way, and if you read the history of the feminist movement from the 70s through the 80s through the 90s and how they changed their po politics, you'll see that they came to realize that only it was... Most of them were over 45, and it was too late. Um, so that's the third, the third uh, phrase. It's all one context now. Suffering in, in pregnancy and, child, and childbearing, pain for, for, for birth. You'll not be able to opt out of it because you'll have, be craving for children. And he will determine whether or not you have children. That's the he should roll over you he will decide whether to impregnate you or not. We have learned from history and archaeology that in ancient times, when a man had a harem, and by the way, since there are always more women than men, I mentioned this to some of you, there are always more women than men because men routinely and regularly kill themselves off in foolish things like war and motorcycle racing and other things. Um, if, you, if you require monogamy, you are decreeing that some women can't be married. And as a liberal, I always wondered how you could justify that. Isn't a liberal supposed to be in favor of people making their own choices and no one should impose his will on anybody else? A woman says, I don't want to be alone. I'd rather be a co-wife than be alone. Who is the government or the official holders of the ideal right and wrong to tell her, no, you can't do that? We don't allow you to do that. I never understood the liberal position on that. At any rate, what men did was... They had several wives. The beautiful ones, they made sure it didn't become pregnant because it spoils their beauty. They used them for pleasure. And the ones that are less beautiful, let them provide children for the next generation. That could be an ex explanation of he will rule over you within the context of this verse, the subject matter of this verse, which is childbearing. In which case, it doesn't at all describe a global rulership of, of men of women. Okay. Yeah. Um, why, why, where, did, where did tree come from? Why a tree? Why did God... Why trees? What's the hold behind it? In the Kabbalistic literature, a tree is a very, very central symbol. Um, I don't know how to say it in terms of, I mean, it could have been grains, it could have been animals that are there, it could have been anything. It could have been bread growing on trees, it could have been anything. Um, I'll just give you a, a couple of features of trees that are, are very important. Number one, the source of their lives, the source of their, their ability to live is hidden. Underground. It's in the roots. For us, that's a very important symbol. The source from which everything in our world comes is hidden. Second of all, there's a long, complicated process from the roots to the fruit. Indeed. If you didn't have experience or read books about how a tree is structured and somebody showed you a root and an apple, you would never dream there was any relationship between them at all. They have almost nothing in common. That shows you that whatever the root is, by the time it gives birth to a fruit, a long process has, been, has taken place. And the fruit is very different from what the root looks like. And therefore, when you look at the world, which is the fruit, don't make simple facile inferences as to what the root must be like that it came from. 
uh, there may be a lot of intermediary processes. Number three, when you grab hold of the fruit, you are in contact with the root. You're in contact with the root. Yeah, there's an intermediary, but if you uh, move the fruit, some of that motion will be transferred all the way back to the root. So the process is one where you can get into connection with the root. It's just that you get into connection through intermediaries. All these ideas are ideas that are central in understanding how we relate to God. And why did God uh, make such a thing that, okay, if you guys do this, then you're going to get punished? Is there any death? Um, the whole purpose of our existence in this world is to act with free will in a way that means we have acted responsibly and done what is right. It's to choose between right and wrong, between good and evil, to be virtuous or with the full choice of being vicious, but to be virtuous. The purpose of it is moral and spiritual self-creativity. Self-creativity. This is the, cre the key thing, that God left the human being incomplete. Every action that you perform adds content to yourself. It molds your character. And the idea is that a human being should be self-creative so that, in the end, what a human being is depends upon himself. Similarly, only similarly, not identically, but similarly to the idea that what God is depends only on himself, so what a human being is, in part, depends only on himself, not something outside of him. In that respect, human being comes to resemble God. This is part chapter 2 in The Way of God by Lutzato. So, and nothing else is like that. Squirrels aren't like that, and angels aren't like that. They're all programmed from the outside. They're all programmed by God as creator. Only human being can be godlike in that respect that something about the human being is because of his own self, not because of something outside of him. In the human being's case, it's because of his free will. In God's case, it's because of his essential nature. But in both cases, you have this common element that what you are is because of yourself, just like what God is is because of himself, not something outside of him. That's the, the common element. Okay, that's what we have to say. We'll pick it up tomorrow in session. Mm -hmm.